Greetings and welcome to this panel on democratic resistance. My name is Rachel Epstein. I'm a professor at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies. And we have two very distinguished panelists joining us for today's conversation. We have Damon Wilson, who is the CEO and president of the National Endowment for Democracy. And we also have Svetlana Tsikonuska, who is the democratic leader of Belarus. Welcome to you both and thank you so much for being here. Svetlana, if I could, I'd like to start the panel with a question to you, which is, I wonder if you would be willing to give us a brief overview of the democratic movement in Belarus and how you arrived at this moment. Thank you, hello everyone. Uh, I'm so glad to be here and talk, speak on behalf of all the Belarusians. In August 2020, we had uh, elections uh, that were stolen by uh, the regime. Uh, Lukashenko, our ex-president, uh, had been ruling our country for 27 years, but in 2020, Belarusians uh, said no to him, and uh, they voted for another person, for, for me, uh, just to bring our country to democracy. People don't want to live under dictatorship anymore, we want to move further, uh, but uh, Lukashenko put our uh, land into the hell since then. Uh, we experienced so many uh, violence, so many humiliation, physical and moral. Um, since then, uh, there were huge um, uh, uh, suppress of our uh, movement. Uh, thousands uh, of people are in jail now, including my husband, Sergei Tikhanovsky, and uh, Viktor Babarika, one of uh, candidates for presidency. And... Uh, Hundreds of thousands of people had to flee the country because of repressions. All the alternative media have been closed in Belarus and uh, different organizations and NGOs also have been closed. Uh, so Lukashenko wants to silent up uh, Belarusian people. He wanted to turn the page for Belarusians again became slaves of, uh, uh, of this dictatorship, but uh, Belarusians woke up at last and for more than a year and a half, we are continuing our fight uh, from the ground, from exile. We uh, mobilized uh, uh, Belarusian diaspora all over the world. We found so many allies uh, among uh, democratic countries and I'm grateful for unity of uh, democratic countries in the world that um, understand what we are fighting for and they are on our side. And uh, since then, uh, Lukashenko isn't recognized as legitimate rule of our country and uh, all his decisions, all his deals uh, are not to be recognized as well. It is difficult fight. Uh, people are really suff uh, suffering in, in Belarus, people are scared, but despite of this, they are overstepping uh, their fear and every day do something, maybe sometimes it's very small, but it's uh, uh, obvious for regime that people are not giving up. And, uh, you know, it's easy to scare people with the help of violence and guns, but regime is afraid of uh, peaceful people uh, of Belarus and our demands uh, from the regime are uh, very simple. We want uh, we demand new elections where people uh, will be will choose a person they want to see, uh, you know, in, in as a president of our country. And of course, uh, we are demanding release of all political prisoners uh, and uh, stop uh, stop of repressions. Thank you for that. I I want to follow up if I could just briefly because you describe a very difficult situation, which of course is in recent weeks become much more difficult with the Russian military presence now, which extends to Belarus. Do you have any recent news or fears about that particular situation and the prospects for democratic renewal in Belarus, given these new developments with the massing of Russian troops on Ukraine's borders? No, every day I'm watching videos and photos of troops uh, movements in Belarus and uh, uh, there are perhaps the biggest military exercises in the history of our country. And of course it concerns me, it concerns Belarusians a lot. The drills are taking place in secrecy and we have very little information what's going on. And the biggest questions, the question, will these troops leave Belarus after February 20th uh, when drills end? Uh, so if they stay, uh, troops will become a threat to our sovereignty. And uh, uh, maybe Lukashenko thinks that he's uh, controlling the situation, but uh, is he? You know, therefore, uh, I urge democratic 
uh, countries, uh, our allies, to pay more attention to what's going on in Belarus. I understand that uh, all attention now is uh, on Ukraine, but we shouldn't allow Belarus to become a um, uh, like small coin in uh, a big political game. Uh, on the other hand, uh, let's uh, not forget how it all started, how it happened that Lukashenko became the threat to the whole region. We have, um, as I said, uh, we have thousands of political prisoners, hundreds uh, um, of uh, journalists are working underground. So uh, I urge the United States and the international community to keep Belarus on the agenda and uh, you know, those who are fighting for uh, democracy on a daily basis. As for our... Uh, pro-democracy pro movement. It continues, it, it has never stopped. But if the threat to our independence becomes true, Belarusians will fight for it as bravely as they did the last one and a half years. With these drills, uh, you know, Lukashenko wants to um, hide uh, lawlessness, uh, our domestic problems behind something bigger, behind this, uh, uh, this uh, Russian Ukrainian relationship. But, uh, you know, we want to focus on the uh, Belarusian issue. And of course, we are keeping a close eye on, on these drills and we are preparing for any scenarios. Thank you for that answer. Damon Wilson, you have very long and deep experience in Europe. I wonder if you would be willing to comment on how you see Russia's conduct affecting the prospects for democracy in the region and beyond and elsewhere. Thank you, Rachel. It's a real honor to be with you and particularly an honor to be here with Svetlana. Um, as she well knows, on my first day as president and CEO of the National Endowment for Democracy, I met with Svetlana because what she represents really is the extraordinary resiliency and the demand for democracy. And she's helped lead a movement that has really awakened the, the people of Belarus. Um, and you just don't put that back into a bottle. And as she said, Lukashenko fears people, his own people. This is what we see playing out in that right now in Ukraine. Uh, Vladimir Putin isn't afraid of Ukraine or he doesn't fear an attack from NATO. He's actually afraid of the agency of people to determine their own future. And so what we see right now, the massing of 130,000 troops, the exercises that began ominously today in Belarus, the uh, uh, movement of Black Sea uh, ships through the Mediterranean into the Black Sea uh, is really to now align uh, the ability to strike on Ukraine and to repress its ability, the Ukrainian people's ability to determine their own future. This has profound consequences for the cause of freedom, the cause of democracy, in the region and around the world today. Because with this, Vladimir Putin thinking of his own legacy of how he can restore a sense of Russian empire, how he can roll back the gains of the post-Cold War era and how he can dominate uh, certainly his neighbors even as he frustrates Western powers in the United States. That there's a lot at stake in what's un under uh, unwinding in Ukraine today. Even the story of Belarus, the repression that the people of Belarus faced was repression coached from the Kremlin, whether it was their media, advisors and broadcasters during the crisis, to the coaching of Belarusian forces, to boa constrictor techniques, to, to push back people on the streets and repress. Um, we are seeing Vladimir Putin export the tools of autocracy, and it's about to take on an even more ominous stage in, in Ukraine. Thank you. I wonder if you could um, take this opportunity to explain a little bit about what the National Endowment for Democracy does to assist specifically in countries like Belarus, in countries like Hungary, elsewhere in the world. Tell us a little bit more about your work and how you help movements uh, realize the promise of democratic governance. The National Endowment for Democracy is really, it's a beautiful, unique creature in that it was uh, created by Congress and is funded by Congress, but set up to be an independent institution really grew out of the movement of, of labor unions and under the Carter administration, support for human rights and support for solidarity in Poland, combined with President Reagan and a strong stand against communism, uh, announcing 40 years this year in the Westminster speech, his intent to help support the creation of something which became the National Endowment for Democracy, passed with legislation on the Hill, but set up as an independent entity, bringing Democrats, Republicans, business and labor together 
to say, despite our own differences at home, when we engage and support those overseas, it's with a sense of commitment of our values to stand by those that need support. Democratic institutions, practices and values, civil society, non-governmental organization groups, independent media. And so our approach is quite unique in that we don't have requests for bids. We don't say what we're trying to do. We listen. We say, what do you need? How can we help? Because it recognizes that the struggle for freedom, the struggle of democracy, it's not our struggle. It's not an American struggle. It's a universal aspiration as the people of Belarus have shown, as the people of Ukraine are showing right now. And so what our job is just to say, how can we be helpful? How can we support you? This is not a group of Americans showing up to say, here's how democracy works. Uh, we bring a healthy dose of humility to our work, even as we bring confidence to the values that unite us with our partners around the world. Thank you, Svitlana. I wonder if you would like to answer some of Damon's questions. What can outsiders do to help? I think outsiders do want to assist in democratic movements. We are also, with humility, aware that sometimes external assistance can create backlashes that are actually not helpful to the democratic movements. Um, so how would you answer Damon's question when Ned comes to you and says, how can we help? What do you say? So first of all, I'm uh, grateful to the international organizations that support Belarusian journalists, activists, and uh, human rights defenders. And uh, you know, of course, I would like to use this opportunity to thank Damon Wilson and Ned for many years of support for Belarus uh, for our civil society groups. But in uh, our situation, you know, it's important to make assistance flexible so it can reach people on the ground first of all, because regime does uh, whatever. Uh, it takes to make uh, people feel abandoned. Uh, they, um, uh, they closed all the organizations that through which uh, this help could reach uh, people uh, in Belarus. And our situation is un unconventional and it requires unconventional solutions. So we, uh, uh, again, we are grateful, you know, uh, all the organizations, they are trying to uh, solve uh, any problems. They are very open to our requests and, uh, you know, it, it's, very, it's very easy and comfortable for us to work with uh, such understandable uh, organizations. Great, so I have a couple audience questions that I'd like to put to both of you. Um, the first one has to do with Belarus specifically, and I'd be eager to get your answers from both of you. So Lukashenko managed to stay in power. And so um, this audience member is wondering um, in what tangible ways, despite the fact that Lukashenko ma managed to stay in power, did the protests in Belarus influence the political situation in Belarus? Yeah, uh, Lukashenko is still in power, but he's still in power uh, thanks to violence, you know, and it's easy to threaten people with the guns and, uh, and repressions, and it's understandable. But Belarusians managed uh, and are managing to keep regime in fear as well. They are afraid of Belarusians who are not giving up, who uh, take every possible uh, uh, tools, you know, to, to fight uh, against this regime. You don't want to be on the same level with the regime and use violence from our side. I'm sure that in the 21st century, it's absolutely necessary to work through diplomacy. Uh, we are civilized people and uh, our uh, strength is our unity and uh, our consistency. Uh, we managed for a year and a half to keep unity among democratic forces, among uh, people in Belarus, among our international allies. There is absolute consensus uh, about uh, Belarusian situation. Everybody understands what we are fighting for. Uh, we are fighting for dignity. We are fighting for values, and we have to, you know, to to keep um, to keep this path. So uh, Lukashenko feels very, and Lukashenko and his regime, his cronies, uh, feel very fragile. That's why uh, they need to escalate the situation, you know, to hide, uh, hide behind uh, uh, more global issues, you know, to uh, make people uh, forget about political and human humanitarian situation in Belarus. And Lukashenko will never be able to 
gain his uh, uh, status of, of strong person in Belarus. He is not respected. People want him to leave and he feels this. And uh, he's very weak at the moment. And this is, uh, this is because of uh, Belarusian people. Good. Damon, would you like to comment on that and maybe also reflect on other democratic movements around the world, some of which have ousted autocratic regimes, others of which haven't, but might have had the kinds of lingering constructive effects that Svetlana just talked about? Sure. First of all, in the context of Belarus, I mean, what Svetlana was part of was an awakening of the people of Belarus and, the, and, and that the facade is gone. And that most of the people of Belarus understand that their leader stole this election and is retaining force through power and violence. And it, it just underscores the sense of resiliency. You can't extinguish that demand, uh, that desire to be able to determine your own future. You look at Ukraine today, and what's unfolding in Ukraine today has a history. Um, Stalin tried to wipe out the Ukrainian people with a great famine in 1932-33, where millions of Ukrainians died. And yet you see this extraordinary resilience and it doesn't just depend on a leader. It, it shows the power of people to shape their destiny, um, whether it was the Orange Revolution, the Euromaidan, the vote of, of Ukrainians in 1991 that helped bring down the Soviet Union or the activation and mobilization of civil society today, which is having to give the Kremlin uh, second thoughts to think about an attack on Ukraine to see an activated, mobilized people. And so I think part of what we're seeing is that the autocrats are learning. The dictator's learning curve is, is a thing. And it's been empowered by technology, by shared techniques. We see Lukashenko being coached from Moscow. And by turbocharged by a technology, if you think about things like AI-enabled surveillance and what that means. So for those Democrats around the world, it does mean that they need to continue to think about how do we innovate? How do we raise our game? How do we learn more quickly? And I think that's some of the ingenuity and creativity you see from this unleashing of individual action. And so it's a tough time. Rachel, you're right. Arguably, uh, we are in the 16th year of a democratic recession, which is really characterized as much by an authoritarian resurgence driven by the sharp power of Russia, the sharp power of China. But at the same time, we see extraordinary success stories. Even this past year, which was a tough year, we saw democratic breakthroughs in Moldova, in Malawi, in Zambia, in Chile. We see opportunities that give us real inspiration. The people of Belarus, the people of Sudan, who have worked and hard, struggled so hard against, uh, against repression to determine their future. And so uh, I think it really is a, a, a sense that what is a little bit lost in the world right now, um, we are in a moment where there, there are about 15 times more protests happening now than, uh, three times more protests happening now annually than 15 years ago. There is a ferment, a fervent out there. And so yes, the information environment has led to more polarization and division, but it's also empowered activists and populations. And so this is a real struggle and it is playing out and you see, as you saw at the Olympics, President Putin, along with Xi Jinping, working together as autocrats to figure out how to make this world safe for autocracy and kleptocracy. And they've got some powerful weapons in their arsenal, but ultimately what they don't have is the hearts and minds of people that really want to have a say in determining their own future. You just made an incredibly important point, which is that much of our conversation focused on democratic erosion. Of course, that's part of the impetus for the summit. On the other hand, I'm very grateful that you pointed out all the regions of the world where there is also democratic ferment and movement underway. And I think in that respect, I'd like to give Svetlana the last word about what your uh, sources of hope are with respect to the specific case of Belarus. Uh, you know, my hope in, uh, is in uh, Belarusian people and uh, believe that uh, democracy uh, will win. Uh, as uh, Mr. Damon said, that there is a democracy recession in the world, as Secretary Blinken called it, and uh, we have to stand up for values. I really believe that uh, democracy has its own teeth and we have to show these teeth. 
and uh, its moral obligation of every country who uh, that already gained uh, democracy to stand with those countries who are still on their path to democratic changes. And it's, uh, it's important to support every country that uh, is fighting for our common values. But I, again, I want to underline that in the, 20, the 21st century, it's essential to do this through peaceful uh, methods, through peaceful uh, tools. Thank you, Svetlana. We admire you enormously. We are keeping a very close eye on your part of the world and we wish you and your people peace and freedom, certainly. Damon, do you wanna share any last thoughts? You're here, Rachel, you said it perfectly. I mean, I, I come to work every day just totally inspired uh, by seeing people like Svetlana, the people of Belarus, by seeing Ukrainians and their creativity, by seeing how the Taiwanese rally around to other democracies under assault. And it reminds me, despite the setbacks, to understand that, that there is momentum for a democratic renewal. And when we watch a Vladimir Putin or Daniel Ortega, or we will see this in, in Lukashenko, we see dictators have to go through the motions of complete sham fraudulent exercises in democracy because we sort of won the existential argument that legitimacy rests in the people. Legitimacy rests in the power of the people. And I think one of the things that you know is happening right now, question, quite people question sometimes, is the United States able to provide this leadership? What we show and what we feel at the endowment is that democracy isn't the answer to everything. It's a, a process by which people can make their own mistakes, but have a self-correcting mechanism to hold themselves accountable. And it's with that humility that Americans work on our democracy, just as Belarusians, Ukrainians, and Russians should have the ability to shape their own future and their own democracy. And so in this crisis right now, right now what Russia is threatening to do in Ukraine is all about the future of freedom in the world. It demands a moment of democratic solidarity and unity and support of Ukrainians. And it demands, I think, an understanding that the ability to thwart the Kremlin's aggression in Ukraine is actually going to open the pathway, I think, over the long term to a better pathway for the Russian people themselves. Good. Thank you. I want to thank both my panelists so much for being here. And I want to encourage the audience to stay for our next panel which is going to be on democracies and climate change. Thank you both so much. We really appreciate you joining us for this event.